spring, getting into summertime now. And baseball, we've all been around the game of baseball. It's America's game. As I was listening to the defense argument, I think about something that we probably have all heard hundreds and thousands of times in our lives out at the ball fields. The little league game, kids up at the back. There's all kinds of distractions. Sometimes the kids in the field are walking around picking Bay Lilies, a five and six year old. Sometimes they're looking at the concession stand, wondering what candy they're going to get afterwards. And what's the coach and parents always say to that child when they're on the back? Keep your eye on the ball, Billy. Keep your eye on the ball. Over and over again, we have to remind young baseball players keep your eye on the ball, stay. I don't mean any disrespect to, to Mr. Gross, Mr. McGuire. They're, they're fine attorneys. They're here doing their jobs today, and they're representing their clients zealously. But, ladies and gentlemen, all that we've heard from the defense side of this case is an attempt to get y'all's eye off the ball. Get your eye off what's important in this case. What are some of the ways they've done that? In Mr. McGuire's opening, he talked about uh, intellectual disability talked about y'all. I'm going to ask y'all to find uh, many guilty of voluntary manslaughter. Y'all aren't going to have that option. It's not manslaughter. It was an attempt to get you to look over here so you wouldn't see what their client did. About when he told you that, well, <coughs> in his opening, he said, you know, Benny just couldn't bring himself to kill himself. He's trying to get y'all to see Penny as this sympathetic figure that, well, he, he said he was going to kill himself, but he just couldn't bring himself to do it. We certainly didn't have a problem pulling the trigger and killing his wife in cold blood. He certainly didn't have a problem coming out the door and shooting into a crowd of people where there were blue lights everywhere, and there was obviously a police officer in that front door. He didn't have a problem doing that, but, but poor Benny just couldn't bring himself to kill himself kill other people. There again, another attempt to get you to look over here and get your eye off the ball. What else have we heard in this case? Attacks of the investigation. How many times did we hear about this red car? The red car was driven by Miss Laura Brown. She was there that night. She told you she was there. It was there when Sergeant Prather pulled up and when the shooting took place. But it left. But they often asked and crossed, well, that car was never searched. What did we find out when we heard from uh, her from Sled Agent later and the, and the other agents? The, the crime scene investigator, Jeff Crook, said, yeah, it was, a, it was searched. Two other officers with Sled searched that red car later in the night. Didn't find anything of evidentiary value. <coughs> no guns, no bullets, no shell cases. But they spent a whole lot of time trying to get you to look over here. Oh, this is mystery car. That's where the, the mystery second gun is. That there's zero physical evidence in this case exists. They can get you to look at the red car. Maybe they'll throw you off of what really happened. What else can we see? The biggest red herring of them all is Chris Brown and Rico Kingsborough. Now listen. Mr. Scott said this in opening, and I'll say it again. We know Chris and Rico are choir boys. Nobody's trying to say they are. But I'll tell you what they were that night. They were regular guys that, yeah, had a little bit of a criminal past, that heard that their cousin had just been murdered in cold blood by her husband. Murdered. Their cousin Peaches, who they had grown up with, who they loved, their first cousin, they all grew up around each other out there on Apple Orchard Road, that she had been shot and murdered. They were mad, and they told you that. They didn't try to hide anything, y'all. You know, I'm, we're not trying to say that they came to, listen, they're not trying to hide. They came in here and told you, yeah, we were mad. We took this gun, this old rusty gun that we've seen many times already in this case. Y'all have it back in the jury room. Y'all can look at that. This old rusty gun that wouldn't bullets falling out of it on the ground. Of course, the physical evidence corroborated everything they said. They told you they were going out there to do Benny Hall. They were mad. But they're trying to get you to look over here at them. They're not 
not on trial today. The person on trial is the one that killed his wife in cold blood and killed a police officer. If they can get you to look at Rick, Rico Kingsborough and Chris Brown and up, then just maybe they'll distract you from what their client did. There again, folks. Rico and Chris, they admitted to you they, they did something they shouldn't have done. They went out there and they tried to take the law into their own hands. They were angry, they were mad. But here's the bottom line. Even if you believe that the testimony of Ben Quan McGee and Miss Dorothy, they're talking about some shots that were fired sometime before that they just heard. They didn't see anybody shooting anybody. But we just heard some shots over there on the other side of the house. I'll tell you this. That story that you heard from those two is incredible for two reasons. One, you don't run towards gunfire. And they said, well, we heard these gunshots, and then we went over to investigate. But then when the gunfire started later, everybody hit the ground and ran. And why did they go towards that? Because there wasn't gunfire. Did Chris and Rico try to engage that gun? Yeah, it jammed. They got bullets coming out on the ground that were picked up later by Jeff Cook from Slip. There weren't any gunshots. Hannah Houston Price. That's the tiebreaker, folks. She lives over in the other, uh, we all saw her house yesterday. There's a little mobile home off to the right, back side. When she hears the first clusters of shots, she said it was about the same. It wasn't like one shot, two shots, and then a bunch of shots. She said it was about the same amount. Do you remember her saying that? She hears the, the bang, 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 bang. Gunshots. She said she hit the floor and then got up and tried to shake her uh, boyfriend because he was asleep. And by the time she was up off the floor shaking him, the next set, bang, 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 bang. <coughs> Hannah Eustace Price, third party, just impartial, keeping her, minding her own business in the, in the other house. She's the tiebreaker on this photos. What she described to you is exactly what happened. Benny Brown coming out that door and firing the first shots, emptying his pistol just about into the crowd of people, not caring who he killed. And then the police officers having a short break in time, long enough to try to draw their weapons and take cover and fire back. That's exactly what Hannah described. Not what you're hearing from Mr. Gross. He's wanting to stretch that time frame out a lot more than what I heard. Y'all heard her testimony. She said it was a very brief break and then the same amount of shots, which corroborates Benny firing his weapon into the crowd, killing Deputy Rice, and then return fire from Lieutenant Plaxico and Shane Clinton. That's why. The physical evidence that Slid found corroborates that as well. There is no physical evidence whatsoever that Chris Brown or Rico Kingsborough fired a gun out there that night. Zero. They ran metal detectors all around the yard for hours. And the only two rounds they found from this gun was junky 7.65 thousand for the two live rounds that they got out of the gun when they were trying to fire. Folks, it's not a self-defense case. It would be self-defense if you believe the fiction that Chris Brown and Rico Kingsborough Maybe that if they were shooting before, but I would say this, even if you believe they did shoot before, once law enforcement comes into that yard, Roger Rice had been there for a good while. When he pulled up, he had to walk all the way over to the crowd, and ever the peacemaker, Roger's already trying to get the crowd separate. That's when Benny came out. Every officer that testified verified that there was nobody waving a gun around. There was nobody with a gun out. There was nobody making threats at that point. How in the world can they go with the theory that Benny is acting as a hero? It's preposterous, folks. It doesn't match the facts. The hero in this case is not Benny Brown. The hero in this case, at the time they were at Merrill State Road, was Roger Rice, because he was the first one in that yard trying to keep the peace. Not even supposed to work that night. He was there substituting for it, but a fellow officer who couldn't work. He was the hero. He 
was trying to keep the peace in the yard and get the family members out so everybody would be safe. The thanks he got for that was a bullet. This is simple, folks. Murder charge on Peaches, Nicole King's girl, is a murder. It's gross already admitted that. They're not even fighting. Guilty of murder. He went there, he shot her in cold blood. Took her off this earth forever. She's in the grave. Kids being raised by this man. This law. The other man. And there is simply no physical evidence whatsoever. No evidence from the police officers that arrived on scene to support this theory that Benny was acting heroically. Somehow he breaks out this club where he just murdered his wife. There's no evidence on the physical side from what Slim found. There's no evidence from the testimony that that theory holds any water. And like I said, all due respect, Mr. Gross and Mr. McGuire are doing the job for representing their client. So that theory just doesn't match the facts. What does match the facts is this. In his own words, in the back of the ambulance, captured by Tyrone Goggins, he had already told me, he said, Tyrone, Tyrone. Tell him I didn't mean to shoot that officer. I was trying to F her up. He's talking about, he's talking about a female family member, probably Miss Laura Brown, who was standing out there in that crowd. That's intent to kill, folks. He didn't talk about trying to go out there and save Ben Juan McGee. No, he told Tyrone right there after it happened. I was trying to F her up. Let's see what exactly what he said. It's about a minute. Started all that trouble. That's who I'm going to F up. Y'all hear that? You know what jury room. You listen to it. He intended to kill a female in law that had been messing around in, in the family and everything. He had hate in his heart towards her. Transferred intent. That hate that he had to, I would su surmise that was Miss Laura. I don't know who that he was talking about. But he said a female in law, and he was trying to come out the door and kill. That, not about Rico, not about Chris Brown. But that intent of hate, malice he had towards Miss Laura transferred to Roger Rice. He was killed in the line of duty, honorably. <coughs> that intent transferred to Rico Kingsborough, who wasn't doing all the right things that night, but got shot. 
He didn't shoot a gun that night. He was mad. Transferred to him. It transferred to the four officers in the yard, and those are your attempted murder charges. Simple case, folks. And I'm going to ask you in a few minutes to go back in that jury room, respectfully look at all the evidence, and return a verdict, the only verdict in this case that speaks the truth. The only verdict that speaks justice. The only verdict that will give these families finally closure after these long days of waiting. The only verdict you can find in this case, ladies and gentlemen, that speaks the truth and speaks justice is verdicts of guilt. I want to thank you all for your, your attention this week. I'm honored to have spent the week with you all in the service you've given this county. I look forward to hearing your verdict. Thank you.